Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're very well. You're listening to Autistic Voices. I'm Evelyn Charmer. I'm a paediatric therapist and I'm the director of Ed Elf Child Therapy and its sister training company for therapists, the Child Hypnotherapy Institute. And I've recently been diagnosed autistic myself. So I'm very inspired to bring you a diverse and rich range of autistic voices from the community. People who are diagnosed, people who are not diagnosed, people who work alongside and collaborate with autistic families or autistic adults, people who identify as neurodivergent. Please come and join the conversation. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at evelyn, that's E-V-A-L-Y-N-N-E, at child hypnotherapyinstitute.com or contact me via the show. Thank you for joining me with Autistic Voices. So welcome listeners and thank you for everybody out there who listens to the podcast. We've had, we've reached 700 downloads now, which is really brilliant. And um, I'm told by my lovely VA Jackie that we're reaching people in all sorts of different countries and um, lots of places that I really wouldn't have expected. So I'm really happy to have you all here and I'm really grateful for that. But welcome to my guest of the week. Um, let me introduce you to Dr. Shirley Woods Gallagher. So welcome to the show, Dr. Shirley Woods Gallagher. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, more than welcome. Now, just to clarify, you're not a GP. No. Um, and so I just want to say that at the top of the show, and we will get into um, your PhD and everything that you, the wonderful stuff that you've been doing for all those years um, as we go through. But we're going to start, I like to start the show with gratitude. I think it's always a good starting point for any day and anything. So um, I'll let you know what, what I'm particularly grateful for today is I've just had a break. I've had a holiday, which um, is nice, always nice. But I'm really grateful that we've still got some ancient woodlands and forests. I'm a massive fan of nature and being out in the woodlands. Years ago, I volunteered for a lovely organisation called Circle of Life Rediscovery. So shout out to Marina if she's listening. Um, doing outdoor education work with kids in the woods. And it was the best thing ever. I used to do it in my summer holidays. I don't live anywhere near there now, unfortunately. That's why I stopped. But So I've just been to the Forest of Dean. And, you know, there's something magical for me uh, about being out with just nature, just being around. The, I, I just think it's magical. And it's really tapped into some creativity. I've come back with some wonderful new plans and ideas. So that's what I'm grateful for today. So what are you grateful for? I kind of always live with a very conscious thought on me of gratitude most mornings. And I consciously say to myself as I'm, I'm waking up, I have my first brew of the day and I go to the gym most mornings. I always consciously say to myself, I have the power to lift and shape my lived experience today. So I'm not thinking about tomorrow. I'm not even thinking about what I was grateful yesterday. I consciously say to myself, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to try and lift in shape or, or even influence my own reaction of anything that, that could happen today. And I try and carry that thought through. So I'm grateful this morning that I've had a good night's sleep, that I felt energized going to the gym. I was grateful there were less people there because clearly lots of people on the holidays. So you can get on all the equipment that you, you want to get on. And I'm also super grateful because my son's on unpaid work experience with us at the moment. And because of the pandemic lockdowns, he never he was part of that generation that never got work experience at school. So I'm really grateful to have those conversations driving in the car together that you probably not had since your child was super little, driving along somewhere together on an activity because he's 16 and he's a bit cool now. So that I was, we, I was just really grateful listening to Cheesy Pop. And talking about nothing at, at half past seven this morning as well. 
Oh, it sounds wonderful. And I totally I had a, a real lovely visual in my head of that then. And, and my youngest son, I've got two sons. My youngest one is 22 now. Uh, hi, Noah, if you're listening. Um, and some of my favourite moments with him are in the car with music on. We sing our heads off. Yeah. Um, sometimes I go pick him up and to bring him home, things like that. And we'll just spend an hour or two just listening to tunes, singing our heads off. It's just the, it's just the best. Um oh, I- yeah, and I, I totally agree with you about waking up and trying to set your mindset for the day and being, you know, in a in a in a spirit of gratitude. I think it's really important. And I do believe in that. I do as a hypnotherapist anyway, and someone who's interested in psychology and stuff, that you know, I try to teach children that I work with that you can control your thoughts and that they're just thoughts and you can you can control them, you can learn to control them. And that it's about you taking charge of what's going on in your head. And it's not always easy. And I'm not being all flowery and and superficial about it. But I think starting with a conscious, I like how you said you're very conscious about, you know, doing that on purpose. It's it's something that you deliberately do. And I think that's that's something that everyone should do. (laughs) Um, so just to introduce you then. So at the moment you are you joined um, Newbridge Multi Academy Trust as it last year as an executive director. Yeah. Uh, and you do loads of other things. So we're going to come back to all of those things as we go through um, today. But just to give listeners a bit of a flavour, you're a nominee for the 2023 National Diversity Awards. Yeah. Um, you're an autistic lady. Yep. We're late diagnosed, like myself. Um, you've done lots of public speaking um, at conferences and things. You are co-opted onto the Lego Foundation Play for All yep. uh, Accelerator and Neurodiversity Advisory Panel. It's a mouthful, isn't it? So you can tell yeah. us a bit about that. <laughs> and you've also got a passion for film. And you're a member of the advisory panel for children's viewing, which is really important. It's all about the classification, isn't it, of... Um, yeah age appropriate sort of films and things so loads to talk about loads <laughs> can we start with your autistic diagnosis and um you know I know that you're late diagnosed like me so you can talk a bit about that what led you to that uh how you feel about it what it means to you sure so I was I was late diagnosed at 49 um and I, and I stumbled into diagnosis through work, working in special education on needs and disabilities. And I kept seeing lots of profiles of younger, particularly autistic girls and going, mm, yes, yeah, childhood. Mm, yes, yeah, childhood. And then going, hang on a minute. <laughs> Whose childhood's this? And then I, I kind of had this sort of twin track approach of um, I didn't need to know. And then I did need to know. I didn't need to know. I didn't need to know. I didn't need to know. I kind of had these mutual worlds. And then it became this crisis of I need to know yesterday. I can't can't live with not knowing, you know, in in a crisis point. And it was just before the pandemic hit. And I kind of look back. I kind of look back and chuckle now in a compassionate way for the state I was in. I was sat in a waiting room. There was no one else there. I had my hood up. I, I was stimming. I was rocking back and forth going, there's too much pressure. I can't possibly go through this screening deal with anyone. And I look back and I go, there was no one in the room. It was just my own thoughts, wasn't it? My own intrusion, my own thoughts, my own anxiety. And I completely understand why. Because you kind of feel like, if I go through a diagnosis, how do I tell anybody? Because people will feel like I've lied to them. Um, What what will it mean for my parents? What will it mean for my work, my husband, my son, everybody? How will it change things for me or not for me? And you're just in this scramble and jumble of emotions. So I I got screened in and as you know, it's the 50 questions, isn't it? And they would say 18 questions is you know, um, neurotypical, 33 is the cut off. And I always always say to everyone when they meet me, I got 44 out of 55. So no one should ever say, I can tell someone's autistic or not. Because I would go into GP practice and they go, well, you've got a doctorate, you're married, you've got a job. You know, what, what? why does it matter to you? What is it important to you? And thankfully, where I live, you can do self-referral. So I didn't have to go through any of that nonsense. <clears throat> and then I kind of, because the pandemic hit and they phoned up and said, most people don't want to be diagnosed on Teams or Zoom or blah, but we don't know when restrictions may lift not knowing fully what was ahead of us. Do you mind being Zoomed in the evenings or a number of evenings? And I was like, go for it. I really, 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 really need to know. So that's when I was diagnosed. But I got that 
the diagnosis letter came through in the on an evening and then the following morning at nine o'clock we I got a phone call that my dad had been admitted to a covid ward in lockdown one and he went on to die so my yeah. So a massive, notice. massive, huge, huge, uh, well, gosh, what a huge sort of transitional day in yeah. lots of ways. So um, do you want yeah. to talk a little bit about your dad dying on a COVID war? Because that's, you know, a really difficult experience, if you're happy to talk about. I know that it will resonate with so many people out there who've had shared similar experiences to you. Sure. So I... I kind of think regardless of what your what a relative or a really close friend may have died of during the pandemic restrictions, it, the restrictions were on us all. So if your family member was dying of cancer or of dementia in a care home or in a hospice or in a hospice, you equally will have had a tiny, tiny funeral, not being able to see friends and family, you know, what can you do, walk around the block for 16 months because that's what you're allowed to do with restrictions. And it makes grief incredibly complex because you can't even do the sort of normal things that people would do, um, not just in terms of being able to go to a funeral, because my dad's funeral was online for me because I was in the shielding category. So I had to listen to the pre-recorded eulogy from the car park outside and watch 10 people walk in and come out and then drive home. I mean, so, uh, so, but but that for anyone bereaved anywhere in the globe, you know, because you say you've got global, um, you know what I mean, like listenership, then it, it will resonate for anyone, regardless of what your family member died of. And and so, you know, my empathy and my sympathy goes out to everyone on the call because it's not just a case of restrictions have lifted. It's fine now. You can go and visit. You can go and scatter the ashes or it's fine. You can go and visit the grave. You had the, all that time where you couldn't hug anybody. You had all that time, you couldn't go to the cinema to distract yourself or do a new activity or just do something that your loved one you'd lost loved to do. And that might bring you closer. You're walking around the block and coming home. There was something quite dehumanising about it, wasn't there? Um, Absolutely. You know, just that it's... I don't know what the long lasting impact of that is, but I, I'm still feeling it, not just for me, but for everyone I speak to, everything I see going on in the world is a bit like it's we've become a lot more sort of individual, separate, everything's online. Um, me personally, I work online pretty much all of the time, you know. Um, I just think it's created this kind of dehumanising, kind of functional human experience that um, t- it took away so much from us all. And like you were saying about your son, not, you know, being part of the generation who couldn't go out in the world and get their work experience. And there's so many kids who missed on, on two years of education and, and oh, socialization and, and, yeah. and, and the, the reco- repercussions of all of that. But going back to your experience, you've just been diagnosed. So and I know everyone has a very different experience of that for me personally it was a massive relief but it was also a well what what does it mean <laughs> what yeah. I was 52 yeah. so you know not, not much older than you and and similar to you I went through a, a period of working in um special educational needs and working a lot with autistic people and thinking I just get them I just get these people I get these children and then people who I was working with and working for were saying things like well Clearly, you're autistic, aren't you? And they just made this assumption. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, looking at it, maybe <laughs> it's not something I've ever considered. But like you've said that you knew you were different from age four. I knew I was different from age three. I think from my very first big experience, memory wise, that I can remember was a big thing that happened when I was three. Um, so that going on for you and I'm, and I've talked to lots of people who their diagnosis it can it can raise all sorts of different feelings emotions thoughts lots to process yeah. and it can take a really long time to process and yeah. um even if you've been expecting it so a bereavement your father's death on top of that along with the sort of isolation of having to be in a car park listening to the eulogy and drive home and then sort of watch it online and that sort of disparity of connection from your dad you know and and he's in his final goodbyes I suppose all of that must have been enormous to process it was huge it was huge you know what I mean and for me it it led to me being a terrible state when the pandemic restrictions finally lifted you know I had complex grief post-traumatic stress disorder suicidal ideation I saw lots of the NHS (laughs) 
you know I mean who you know in a mental health crisis do help you you know I mean did did you know I mean pull it out of the bag but I had to wait a year to get the help that I did need um and just be able to process process the complexity it's like the government hadn't hadn't allowed for the fact that grief would be complex you know so I've got I've got evidence that's going into the public inquiry uh, you know, I wrote blog posts at the time for Marie Curie around being in the first 40,000 bereaved families, which is a small number in the grand scale. What happened at the end, the Metro News published a big article one year on that was about um, <clears throat> Father's Day and everyone who may have lost a father during the lockdown. And my dad was my safe place growing up. So the one person I would have absolutely wanted to have shared a late diagnosis with uh, would have been him. And also, how do you tell your surviving family members who haven't... And my aunt died two weeks before my dad. So how... Of COVID as well, but in a different part of the country, by short shift coincidence. So how on earth do you tell um, anybody that... Oh, by the way, everyone's world's blown apart because we're in this bonkers pandemic <laughs> that no one saw coming and no one could see each other. And then we've all lost two family members. Most of us couldn't go to the funerals because it was 10 each in different bits of the country. And um, by the way... I'm autistic and I'm a child you can't see because I've got a wonky bronchi and I'm in the shielding category and, and I've got a chronic lung condition. So I might be next <laughs> for COVID. So, so it was much. complex. It was, a, it, was a, it was a lot. So I have real compassion. And I kind of think if it took me 50 years to get a diagnosis, it might take me 50 years to get my <laughs> the, 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 the the manner and the way in which I was diagnosed. But for me personally... Being diagnosed has been one of the, like I think a lot of older people, has been illuminating. You know, you look back on your life and you go, so many things make more sense. So many things make more sense. And I find that I'm really kind to myself rather than being really, really hard on myself. If I'm struggling with something, I no longer have this thought that if I just push my way through this really busy airport, I'll build my resilience. It doesn't, sensory overload just doesn't work that way. So I have real compassion, uh, real care plans that I put in place, and I'm really conscious of what I can and I can't do, and I'm cool with that. So that bit's been fine. What was surprising to me was sharing the diagnosis and people's reactions has been an absolute eye opener. I think because you and I work in SEND, and so we're used to working with inclusive people and inclusive practice, you're kind of in a bubble that, you know, a bit of this echo chamber of, yeah, there's inclusion. And I quickly learned that there wasn't. So it's I quite shocking, saying, isn't it? I know. I, I totally hear you. And when you were saying before about that, one of the first things you said earlier was about what if people don't believe me? And yeah. I, I talked to a lot of people. And I've experienced that myself, that kind of, well, maybe I'm not. Maybe I've made that up. You know, even like yeah. I've had certain family members sort of go, well, we all do that. You know, and yeah. really dismissive. Um, yeah. I found it really difficult. I've found it. I still find it really difficult. Three years on from my diagnosis, to share it with people because what I've found is people that I thought would be really compassionate and understanding, want to know, and curious, have been yeah. completely as if it never happened. Yeah. Just, yeah. It's totally invalidating. You, you mentioned it once. Don't mention it again. Yeah, yeah. A bit like that. And I've had, yeah. I've also had, um, you know, from a family member, things like, oh, st stop blaming everything on your autism. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even if I've mentioned it once yeah. and said, you know, I'm struggling with this because I'm autistic. Oh, no, 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 it's mm. always. A and I've also had experience of, you know, I've had lots of positive ones as well. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just thinking about the sort of difficulties and the surprises. I've also had people say to me actively, well, I would never have known and looking at me suspiciously as if like I'm lying or so. And that doesn't help because you're thinking, well, is it because I've learned to mask all my life? You're trying to justify yourself. Yeah. And I find that really, really difficult. But I'm also like you, yeah. I'm, really, I'm really happy with where I'm at. I'm happy with being autistic and I, I really celebrate being neurodivergent yeah. and I see so many gifts and strengths and great qualities in people and I, I, I you know I think there's a hell of a lot of focus on the challenges when we need to really look at the other side of it as well um and it's a bit like gosh you know how boring it must be to be neurotypical <laughs> <laughs> sometimes um so yeah so you have to sort of override that but I haven't I just can't imagine for you how that must have been on top of everything else and with your dad's death and all of that and 
I don't know. I don't know whether to ask you this question. I'm just going to raise it out loud. You don't have to answer. But I have spoken to lots of people about kind of this imposter syndrome thing. And I had one person say to me, I almost didn't mention it because people in my family would think I was trying to get the attention on me. So when you've got such a massive thing going on, like the death of your father and COVID and everything else, was there a part of you thought, oh, it's not the right time to mention it or... I don't know. Any- I was really conscious that it, the, the late diagnosis may not go down well with all of the members of my birth family. I didn't think it would go well and it didn't. I had to think consciously at the right time. So with it came to sharing other people, I was always really conscious that no one's going to bump into my mum because we're all in these restrictions. But I don't want anyone bumping into anything online and finding out that way so I was really conscious I was desperate to tell people desperate to tell people my big news um but at the same time um worried about it getting back to family and then worried that I already had this strong feeling there would be wider bereavement you know wider loss to experience beyond my dad in the, my birth family, and I actually then was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to lose any friends either, and I don't know whether I can cope with any more loss at this moment in time. Yeah, I can understand that massively. So going back to the top of the show when I introduced you, it was Dr Shirley Woods-Gallagher, and you have a PhD, you're not a GP. Can <laughs> You were the first person in your family to go to university, and you're also the first person in your family to achieve a PhD level academically. Um, so um, how was that, and is that tied in? with the sort of, you know, how you thought, how you expected that um, it might be received, that you're also also autistic. Yeah, I mean, I'm the first woman. I'm not the first person, you know, to go to university. I'm the first woman um, in what they're all in my generation. But, um, yeah, it was good. It was a good feeling to go. I was really proud to go. Um, Because I have such a strong, innate sense of social justice, you know, go think who knew. In the 70s, I used to be going, why are my brothers doing that and I'm not allowed? Why are boys in class allowed to do that and we're not allowed? My hand was up the whole time in infants, let me tell you, about calling out, that's wrong, that's sexist, you're treating girls differently to boys, why it makes no sense. And you, I kind of look back now and go, God, it was kind of obvious in many respects, including stuff like this. So I never saw the hierarchies of the barriers. It was like, no, that's what I'm going to do and that's what I'm going to do. So my undergraduate degree, it was the very first year they'd opened this course and it was for six students only because they were allowing you to go to the European Parliament, which is a story for the grandchildren, isn't it? European Parliament for half of a year and the House Commons for half a year. I remember going, right, I'm going to apply for that. And my dad going, that's great, but there's only six places and you'll be competing with all these private school kids and kids all over the country and da 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 we need to, and there were alternatives that you could apply for, you know what I mean, which I did do. I said, well, that's my first choice. And he was like, you might need to manage your expectations. There's only six. I went, yeah, but why wouldn't I be one of those six any more than someone who's been to Harrow or something? I, I don't, you know, I'm doing it. <laughs> so, and you absolutely again, did do it. So, again, what, who knew? <laughs> so well done, honestly. It's a, it's a really incredible story. And I guess your dad was just trying to protect you from any, totally. you know, manage your expectations. No, with, your, with, your, with your parent head on, looking backwards, it's, yeah, different. You make, yeah, you get it. And mm. so what, what was the PhD in? So the PhD was in democracy, because I got to the end of my undergraduate degree, and I genuinely thought, is that it? Is that it? Is that what all this fuss has been about? <laughs> you, your exams, getting in, da da da, and that's the highest exam you want me to do. Really, I'm bored. I want to do more. I so I said, it. I want to do a PhD. I love it. You know, I love it. I love it. I, you know that sort of that sense of you know justice and not seeing the hierarchy and all of that can be really powerful. I think when you focused it in the way that you focused it, and I think that's really inspiring. Thank for young you. women today and older women, you know, to to not allow these kinds of, um, I don't know, ideas about how the world works to to get in your way and just to go, do you know what? I'm going to do it. And and totally. off you, yeah, I love the it. The reality is, people are so more, mostly swept up in their own lives, isn't it? I've learned this through life as I've got older. Most people are so involved in their own lives; they're not really observing you that much. They really, we're not that interested in one another. People have got so much going on. So don't care so much what other people think. And if other people are really up in your business with nasty comments about you doing well, well, that's about the relationship they have with themselves, not you. 
Yeah, so wise words. Mark it, move on. They're not even in your hula hoop. Stay in your hula hoop. Yeah. Yeah, stay in your lane, I call it. The same yeah, thing. I like staying in your hula hoops just as yeah. good. Um, so you talked about being desperate to, to share your news about your diagnosis, and eventually you did. And then in 2022, you went public about it. For the first time, didn't you? And that was at yeah. something called the ABL Conference Crisis to Calm at yeah. Bolton Stadium. So tell us a bit about that conference and what that was like coming out as yeah, an autistic I mean, lady. There. I was all, at that point, I would, I'd already um, outed myself because people had started to out me. <laughs> I'm not always in the best ways, if that makes sense. So yeah. I thought, right, even though I'm not ready to be big, bold and out there, if anyone's going to tell this story, it's me. So I started going on LinkedIn you know what I mean? Showing it on broadcast emails at work and all, the, all over my social media. This is who I am. This is what you don't know. Blim. And then about two months later, I did that conference. So I just went, foot to the floor, live or die, sink or swim in this moment. So it was a conference that uh, an ex-colleague uh, who I used to work with at Oldham Council, he'd left his organisation and gone to join to work for ABL. And he went, I've been looking at your LinkedIn posts, can see what you've done. Um, it's about mental health practitioners. No one will be expecting a really senior executive to come on stage and say they're autistic. Would you Would you be prepared to come and talk? I'm like, yeah, sure. And then I get there and I look round up, because it's a football stadium, isn't it? So there's like 400 people in the audience. And I think, oh, wow, I actually don't know how this is going to go well. I actually, apart from Rousey who'd invited me, don't know anyone here. So this could be a really, really uncomfortable Thing. And some of the a couple of the speakers on before me said some things that just made my blood boil as well about autism. And I'm thinking, but I can't get up and be dysregulated and just go, can I believe what they just said? It's so able. <laughs> the minute I get the microphone, because I almost play into a trope and a stereotype of, you know what I mean? So I get I get up and I talk about, you know, I don't really agree with someone's just said, I'll tell you why. Do you know what I mean? And I go into this big speech around um autism and what my job is and everyone's listening to me because it usually because it says doctor you know what I mean da, 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 people listen to you I'm not saying that's right or wrong so I've got the audience the palm of my hand and then halfway through I just flip it to one slide and it's a selfie of me in my garden and it's I've got a t-shirt on and the t-shirt says woke up autistic again so in a football stadium it comes out as it's 44 you can't not miss me in this t-shirt and you could hear people going <gasps> and I literally go I pretty much did I pretty much had a woke autistic again. You weren't expecting me to say that, were you? And a few people on the front row who'd been a clinical psychologist speaker, you could literally see them readjusting their balance on the on their front seats. Um, um, we had some great conversations, but afterwards it led to two people in the audience coming to me, privately disclosing, one of them saying that she can't even get a volunteer job in her bit of Greater Manchester because of her autism diagnosis. So that led to me linking her up with another organisation who was there, linking up with the people who are responsible for employment in that particular area of Wigan and getting her some proper uh, paid work experience. Oh, gosh, I bet she was so happy that she broke through her own, you know, um, comfort zone and came and talked to you about that. What a brilliant yeah. um, outcome. And I, 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 it's totally, it's interesting, isn't it, really, is I, I teach, uh, I do lots of training for therapists. And one of the things I do is I teach a diploma in hypnotherapy for another organisation I won't name. There's plenty, there's, the others, mm -hmm. others are available. Um, <laughs> and I've taught lots of different courses there, so I know this can't identify anyone either. But the so one of the first courses I did was not long after I had my diagnosis, around the same time. And I decided to wait and I told them on the very last day. So they'd been with me for a year. They do like 10 or 12 modules over the year. Um, and I think partly because I was thinking it'd be interesting to see if it what their view is. If I tell them at the beginning, they'll be looking for things or they'll match it, to, they'll find evidence that supports their own paradigms, you know, their own beliefs about what autism is. So I didn't tell them um, until the very last session. And I had things like, well, you hide it well, or you'd have never known. And one person who actually works with autistic adults came up to me and said, well, gosh, I'm really surprised you're the most competent autistic Ooh. I've ever met. And, and I was like, oh, my God. So it was quite... So People and that was a very educated person, I have to say, yeah, yeah. and works with autistic people. So I think even in those worlds, 
sometimes people can really make assumptions if they've met a certain person or group of people who might have similar issues or needs they will make assumptions that that's what everybody's autistic profile is like so that's why I started the show that's why I started the show and I'm really glad we've got 700 downloads now because the more voices so if you're out there and you want to come on please do because the more people speak on shows like this and there are other people doing things like there's autistic radio and other things going on um the more that it educates people that what they've seen and experienced might not or what they've assumed might not be the truth so well done on coming out at that um abl and i imagine that was really empowering for you. It was, it was. I was kind of totally flooded with adrenaline at the end of it. <laughs> I mean, really, because I didn't know how it would go. I didn't know people would be like whispering in corners. I, di- I didn't, I didn't know how it would fly. But having done a number, I've done a lot since, a lot since. I kind of say there are three very broad reactions. One more pe- people are just embracing and accepting. And they'll even be humble about what they don't know themselves. And, and they're, you know, they're, they're just gorgeous mm-hmm. about it. I would then say there's like a huge group of people who are called the I call them the clumsy crew, and it's a it's a crude description. <laughs> but what they're trying to tell me is that they care and they love me, but they have a clue, even if they work within the field. You know what I mean? So they might say it doesn't matter, yeah, or you don't look it, or you've done well for yourself, or that, or they, they just all or oh, still love you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, no. I've had this. I still love you, and I know they they yeah. mean really well. They are gorgeous, and some friends are like you. Just <laughs> for, for us, you're just you. We just yeah. love you for you, and I I get that, and I appreciate that. But I also feel like it's people don't know what to say, and isn't it interesting? Because today we're living in a society where you've got um I can't remember the name of the lovely girl that was on. I think she was on Strictly, and she's deaf. Oh um, yes, yeah. And I mean, you've got yeah. the comedian who's blind, and you've got lots of disabled people. Not enough by any means, but there's certainly a lot more disabled people in the media now. Um, people are really supportive of that. You've got, you know, Lewis Capaldi and Tourette's really raising the profile for that. But yet we're still feeling that we have to gauge when, how, why, and if we disclose that we're autistic or ADHD or neurodivergent in some way. So isn't that interesting? Yeah. Really? I always love to talk, talk about it being like you're coming out about it. There's lots of children and young adults who will never be able to come out because they're already out. Because the parents might have said on social media, my child's got autism, da, 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 da. Or they've been to a special school or they've got an EHCP and it's the diagnosis of need. And why should they have to hide it? And I always say to employers, how wonderful. So many employers are trying to recruit younger people and graduates. Absolutely, as they should. Openly neurodivergent. And I go, and I go that's fantastic. Brilliant. How many of them are over 50? How <laughs> yeah. many of them are over 40? Because unless those age groups feel confident at work, you haven't got an inclusive work, you haven't got a new inclusive workforce culture because they don't feel safe. Yeah. So I don't buy it. So you have to do the old age work. I always say, like, is it was I've got the stats in front of me. So 425,000 autistic people diagnosed in the UK, and 36% of those were diagnosed over the age of 50. So that's like a third of all autistic people in the country are diagnosed over. <laughs> it's it interesting, isn't it? I know. And, and I, There's loads I do, of us. That's it. And I haven't applied for a job since my diagnosis because I work, I'm self-employed now. But I'm also a bit like, gosh, I wonder what that would be like because it's a whole new world. And I know there's a hell of a lot of amazing work going on out there about inclusivity and diversity in the workplace and all of that. And I'm really... I'm amazed at how much amazing work's going on out there, actually. But there's also a long way to go, and I there's do think huge, that I, yeah. you know, I'd be, I'd be worried, I'd be reticent about it. But let's move on to you are a recognised leader, and and I'm really people like you are what make it happen, you know, because you. without you, someone like you speaking out, Shirley, and going out of your comfort zone and putting those risks out there, and challenging yourself and like you say it does affect you it has and does affect your mental health and you've gone through bereavement at the same time COVID everything else you being at risk of COVID too so with all the stuff you've done in the past few years around this is is incredible and I do thank you on behalf of lots of people I know listening will be saying the same shouting at the phone or whatever they're listening on um and very well deserved you were nominee for this year's national diversity awards 
And um, I had a quick look on your profile on there and they talk about how you've worked in local government, as you were saying earlier, for over 20 years, mostly in Manchester. Um, You helped write the devolution deal for early years and you presented what works from that to the both the Education Select Committee and the Science and Technology Select Committee of UK Parliament. And that's really high level stuff as well. Yeah. So do you want to say anything about that? Um, well, I kind of think the, the great thing about being autistic, because I couldn't have re- re- done these things with, without the way that I think and um, and how I am. <clears throat> that yeah, I had a the big thing of looking at everything that works for early years, bringing it together in one easy way, trying to monetize it trying to see how cost effective it is. And so I love the fact that the new, I find it hard to say new princess of Wales and think of the new princess of Wales in my head. You know, the, her great early years foundation, I applaud that because an effective early years system breaks even when children are aged seven. Now, no electoral cycle is for seven years. So you're never gonna get, it's it's the Conservatives party's policy or the Liberal Democrats or the Greens or, or Labour because the, you know, there's be, there'll be a general election after five years. So that's really, it has to be about everyone in it together and thinking of future generations. And the biggest recipient of a really effective, brilliant early year system is the Department for Work and Pensions because they pay less benefits and more people pay work for tax, put crudely. So that was our hustle. That's the premise of the evidence to give to parliaments and for them to be thinking a bit more long-term strategically about investing in future generations rather than thinking of these sort of five-year cycles. So I'll hustle for early years all day long. And it's interesting because we said at the start the impact the pandemic had. When we look at the impact of children who were in reception in year one now, you can see the lockdown in terms of language acquisition, fine motor, gross motor, let alone social, emotional, mental health. <clears throat> and this is before we were even considering whether the, the born neurodivergent and that hasn't yet been picked up as well. So the best business case I always think for early years is just go back and look at those cohorts now who didn't get a thing because even the, the parks were roped off. You know, the swings and slides were roped off. If you can't go back climbing, then you can't develop your gross motor that helps with your fine motor. You know, so the best business case for sure, so I always say, is the lockdowns. <laughs> go go and retrofit it now and give it back to government, back whoever's going to get next in office. Yeah, and I can hear that young girl in you saying, this isn't fair, this isn't just, I'm going to do something yes, about this. Like- so well done on that as well. And also, I'm really interested to know a bit more about what this is, the Lego Foundation Play for All Accelerator and Neurodiversity Advisory Panel that you've been co-opted into. What's that about? Yeah, so years ago, Lego put out a great big advert saying, you know, this this little little Lego superhero, you know what I mean? He's autistic, so he's got superpowers, so he can do these amazing things. And you can imagine it didn't go down that well with the international neurodiversity community. <laughs> So in response, kudos to to Lego, they rode back from that position and they actually said, actually, we strongly recognise that there is such a thing as Lego therapy used in lots of special schools. But beyond that, we know a large cohorts of neurodivergent children absolutely love our Lego sets. So we'll put somebody aside, we'll set up a foundation and what we'll do is trial different approaches that may work for, for children who are neurodivergent around the globe. Um, And so they, uh, so I was involved in an advisory board for some of those. Um, so that's testing all sorts of different approaches. But some of the initial work that they've done has been heavily invested in ADHD cohorts, which Lego freely recognise as massively under-resourced. So it's really exciting to be involved with that. But I got reached out for doing that because of the things I post on LinkedIn, a connection I have with someone who was involved with Harvard University. So who knew this little Lancashire girl, you know? <laughs> from a socioeconomic background that really shouldn't get a PhD <laughs> or do half the things I've done, can, can then go on to do anything because I just don't see hierarchy. Good. Um, and that's um, why I think it works. That's why it works. And that's why it's yeah. so inspiring because you haven't allowed those, uh, I call them unwritten rules, like those societal unwritten rules that can impact on people's motivation to try and do something or belief that they can um yeah. just isn't there with you and you've just gone yeah I want to do that so I'm going to go do that you know and and you, yeah. you absolutely deserve to have done what you've done and Thank it's you. led you down some really interesting cul-de-sacs and lanes and I'm, I really appreciate you telling us about the Lego Foundation play for all thing because I didn't know anything about that so I'll be looking mm-hmm. that up 
um so uh, the other thing is then is your main role despite those things um you joined the Newbridge Matt and the Multi Academy Trust as an executive director and that's a trust with over two uh 2000 students with SEND needs yeah um so are you out as a neurodivergent adult in that leadership position and what's that like for you I absolutely am out you know what I mean I absolutely <clears throat> have to be I'm, I'm out and obviously I don't see a awful lot of students day to day as an exec member I'm an advisory member but I do do you know some work with the students with you know the head teachers and others so for example at the start of term the school inset day one of the schools and I'm part of the school inset day to do a big show time with all the staff welcome back da, 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 da. this is what we know key stats if you didn't know this about me this is me this is my lived experience and what I often share is these are some of the prejudice I, I experience day to day now being now. I'm strong, I'm confident, I don't say hierarchy. Um, <clears throat> I'm really senior. <laughs> I'm, an ad- I'm an adult with lots of work experience. This happens to me. So what's it really like for our students when they're not with us? What's it really like when they're not with the parents out and about in the community? What's it really like when they start work and the support that they need? Just to really beef that up. But my favourite people to ever tell other students. So we went to, took three different groups of students to Disneyland um, at the start of the year. And I was sharing villas and accommodation in my group with, with children who've all got a diagnosis of autism, but they can access the national curriculum and go on to get GCSE and so forth. So it's the sort of school I would have benefited from rather than the horror show that I had to go through. Um, and and I just tell them I'm autistic. I'm autistic like you. And this is my passion. What do you want to do? Let's find it. For you. And just their expression on their face. Because although they're surrounded by staff going, you can be anything they want, we believe in you, blah, blah, blah. And then there might be pictures on the wall of Greta Thunberg or Chris Packham or, you know, like famous celebrities, but it's still abstract, isn't it? It's not someone you meet. And I go, yeah, I must have seen you than your head teacher, the miss or sir. This is what I do. What do you want to do? You can do it. Is I know that means so much to them to have those conversations and just to visib- visibly see that. So sometimes I walk around with a... <clears throat> I did it with our college students and I got trolled online by a welfare rights officer for posting positively a while back. It was about a year ago on LinkedIn and they would literally posted, you need to stop posting like this. Most autistic people won't work. So I reported it for hate speech. I went back to the organisation and said, well, they won't do with that attitude. You know, maybe you're you're in the wrong job. Um, And then she trolled me for saying I'm normalising autism. So I got a T-shirt printed, normalising autism. So I walked around college with our students trying to get jobs and, and with their work skills, go normalise autism. Oh, oh, miss, you're wearing that. Love your T-shirts. Go, cool. I've got custom makes, I've got trolls. So if you if you give me, sh- get, throw me shade, I'll turn it into a, in a pride slogan any day of the week. I'll own this as pride. And and so like, what, what do you want to do? And it, you can just see them going, oh my good God, I didn't expect this conversation. And it builds them up and builds their confidence because there's people out there who will just be throwing bricks all day long. Yeah. And you know what I love about that story as well is it shows that it that that not paying attention to hierarchy, not mean meaning much, goes both ways. So you as a leader, you're putting yourself on the same level as those young people as well and saying, look, I'm just like you. And um I think I work very much like that. I totally, totally relate to that. Um and when I worked in the autistic specialist school I worked in, I wanted I was like, I wish I'd gone to this school or a school like this. (laughs) Um but I now work as a therapist, as you know, and I work with a lot of kids that were, uh, go, still go to that school along with many others. And it's a joy to be able to tell them that I've been diagnosed too. And it is something that really helps level things out and it helps them go, oh, yeah, it's someone I know who's in a, has been in a leadership. I was an assistant head, you know, I was head of safeguarding and I was head of residential provision and all sorts of important things. So I think it is important that they can see you on a level and they can, you talk to them. I talk to kids like I would talk to anybody. I think, yeah, you know, I just, I'm not, age means nothing in terms of, you know, respect and being human and all of that. Um, and meeting people where they're at. And I think they love that. But also, and I really enjoy that more than I did having a sort of traditionally hierarchical role as head of this and head of that. Um, because I like to meet people on a level as well, whatever age they are, whatever neurotype. But it does really help when they can relate 
see somebody who's had jobs, had children, been married, done whatever they wanted to do in their life, and they're still doing it. And I always say, look, you know, the paths aren't, they're not set. You can you can go down all sorts of different routes and paths to get to where you want. Totally. And the key is about believing in yourself and feeling, you know, good, feeling positive. And the other thing that I guess I picked up from what you were talking about earlier that you were talking about from your own personal experience as well is it really frustrates me when people don't get the mental health support they need because they're autistic yeah and that's something that needs to change isn't it I know that's going off on a bit of a tangent that's just something I'm really passionate about and listening to what you were talking about earlier and what you've been managing yourself um when you were diagnosed and you're going through bereavement and PTSD and all those things those things are human things that we experience mental health is stuff that we experience as a human being and it doesn't matter to me whether you're autistic or not whether you're neurodivergent neurotypical or whatever it is um mental health is mental health and I hear too many stories of people saying their child or their parent or their sister or their brother cannot get mental health support because once they get into the services, they're told, oh, it's because you're autistic it's, or it's because it's you're prejudice. ADHD. It's prejudice. So yeah. my, my hustle, and I'll do this in professional meetings that I'm in, strategic meetings, all the way things to do my my, you know, in my private private time as a trustee of a charity I'll talk about is around you can't say that someone can't have a service because they've already got a diagnosis because you wouldn't say you're already diabetic you couldn't possibly have post-traumatic stress disorder we would laugh you out of town we would laugh you out of town so I don't buy that on entry we we say well you're, you're nine times higher of suicide risk from autism yeah you are because of prejudice including mental health services so until you get over that it won't work I act and CBT does not cure complex PTSD and other issues. EMDR does. Look at the research and evidence and commission to evidence. Relook at your nice guidelines. Sort things, sort things out. And so for me, one of the key things that I do in my private time is I'm a trustee of a, a charity called Respect for All that's based in Greater Manchester. And it provides... Um, spot purchase through so it has to depend on localities but it's, it's no cost to families and it's for either children young adults or particularly young adults and their parents and carers if they've got a diagnosis of, of neurodivergence and or learning difficulty and they can access therapists and that we do it one to one and we work out it goes as long or as short as they need it to be delivered how they want it to be so that's respect for all, and for all. I'm assuming there's a website people can go to. No, yeah, if people look. literally Google respect for all, um, you'll see every, everything that you need to on there. What we're trying to do at the moment, because it's a group of volunteers doing it with a framework of paid, you know what I mean, um, <clears throat> staff delivering the, the counselling and therapists on a framework. We've got two paid staff, the rest are unpaid trustees, and it's to build the evidence base of actually what works for these cohorts to count them it's cbt but cbt does, doesn't work but you've already got an autism diagnosis to which i say to everyone yeah i've got an autism diagnosis which helps me understand my past reframe myself and understand how i can handle myself better in certain situations yeah that doesn't stop the fact i couldn't process not going to my dad's funeral that's a separate issue and yeah. i defy anyone who wasn't autistic to have found that easy yeah you know so we're coming to the end of the show, Shirley. Thank you for your time. But what would you like to end on? Where would you like, what's your, what's next for you? What you're working on, what's your current focus or anything else you want to put out there to our listeners? And please, listeners, make sure you like, share, subscribe, tell people about the show so that we go far and wide um, and get Shirley out there. That's not that she's not already, but, you know, more spread out there as we can. So where where would you like to end the show? I would like to say to anybody who's going through um, a late diagnosis that you're not on your own. And at times it can really feel like you're on your own and uh, you haven't done anything wrong. You haven't done anything wrong. You, you think of how old you are now and how many different potential decades of life you've been through and you've tried so, so hard to fit in, been told if you just try even harder, you'll 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 fit in or it, it will work. And, and have compassion that, you know, it will almost feel like an identity crisis when you're going through a, a late diagnosis because you think, who am I? Who was I? Who am I going forward? Did, did I even know who I was? And, and it's okay to hold space for at the same time having moments of real euphoria that you understand better. And other times have gone, blow a minute, my head is absolutely mashed with this. 
and they're just moments and then and those moments will pass and as time goes on things will, will get better and in my my darkest moments my bleakest moments I always retain a core thought which is my core belief which is seeds grow in the darkness so as bleak and as dark as it is you know the the blossoms will bloom again you know like nature may look different above ground than it was before the storms and the the big event happened what seeds grow in the darkness and maybe in a more beautiful way and a, and, a, and a deeper sense of gratitude so I do wake every morning and I'm grateful I can go to the gym because for, for 16 months I couldn't I'm grateful that I can go and smell nature and see the tree that we planted in the village that I live because I had them planted all over the high peak. For everyone who died of anything during the pandemic, we have 13 trees, families have as just memorial plaques. And I go past it, I run past it, and I think I planted that. There's my dad's tree. It's not where he wanted it, but I got him a tree and it's near me and maybe that's where he wanted to be. So things work out in the end. Things do work out in the end. Live, live in hope and wake up every morning thinking you absolutely have the power to lift and shape your lives because you do. What a wonderful way to end. And we started the show with trees and we're ending on trees. So yeah. I just want to say a massive thank you on behalf of everyone listening and all the work you do and for the charity and all the work you do in general for all of those different organisations. And for just being you and, and being fearless really or, or, or just feeling the fear and doing it anyway and getting out there and being a wonderful person and a very Thank inspiring you. woman and I'm really grateful you've come on the show and talked to us about about all of that so if anyone wants to contact you are you contactable or do you prefer no contact yeah people can contact me at the at my email address so thank Absolutely. you very much for coming on the show and good luck with the uh, awards, the diversity awards this year, just on the end note then. It's not from a personal perspective. It's about the issues. It's getting the issues yeah. out there, getting them recognised in mainstream media or society in any small way, I think is a win. So, yeah. you know, well done on that. And thank um, again, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening. I'm Evelyn Charmer. This is Autistic Voices. And special thanks to our guest of the week.